Hello everybody, welcome back to Microbiology. Today we'll be doing the Unit 2 exam review. This is going to work like the last exam review where I provide a term and then it's your job to try and think of as many descriptions as possible for that term. Again with this exercise, I highly recommend you studying first before going through this exam review. It's kind of like a little game where you actually want to, you know, try and test yourself and see how much knowledge you've accumulated. For the terms, I'm going to kind of rush through them. Um, that's because I figure that you can always pause the video and take your time if you'd like. Also, I would like to note that for the Viral Explorer Lab, I found the information in there to be pretty broad and uh, a little too much depth for what we need to know in this class about viruses. So the, the information you need to know about viral families is going to be specifically only taken from the lecture portion of the, uh, the course. So that should make it a little bit easier for you. Okay, so let's begin. The first one is virus. So viruses are made of genetic material. This could be uh, RNA or DNA, single-stranded or double-stranded. They are not considered live. Um, they have to infect a cell in order to reproduce and do their metabolism. They are not made of cells and they are extremely small. Next term, DNA polymerase one. Okay. This is the enzyme involved in DNA replication, and its job is to remove RNA primers and replace them with DNA. Okay, next term, transformation. Transformation is the process of naked DNA being passed between cells. So here we can see um, that uh, here we have what we mean by naked DNA is that it's not housed in a cell or in a virus. And one way or another, it enters the cell and you can have genetic recombination where that DNA becomes a part of the chromosome. And because it alters the, uh, the features of this bacteria, it now becomes a transformed cell. Phosphodiester bond. Okay, the phosphodiester bond is the linkage between um, the phosphate group on the five prime end of nucleic acid and the hydroxyl group on the three prime end of, a nu of the sugar of a, a nucleic acid. This creates a phosphodiester linkage it's called that because there are um, two, di, meaning two, uh, ester bonds, which are these double O groups here on each side, between the phosphate. You will not have to specifically draw any of these structures, but you need to be aware of each component of a nucleic acid, that being the nitrogenous base, the ribose sugar, the phosphate group, the three prime end, what's attached to the three prime end being the OH group or hydroxyl group and what's attached to the five prime end being the phosphate group. Specialized transduction. So as you'll recall, some viruses have a lysogenic phase where they assimilate their DNA into the bacterial DNA or the chromosome and become a uh, prophage. In the process of doing so, when this uh, viral DNA becomes activated to continue its replication cycle, seen here in step two, a copy of that DNA, that viral DNA is made 
but in the process of doing so, it can also pick up some of the bacterial DNA and package that into the virus. The virus can then infect a new host, and in the process, it can transfer that bacterial DNA from one bacteria to another bacterial cell, carrying over that genetic information. And that form of horizontal gene transfer is called specialized transduction. Now we have ligase. This is the enzyme that's involved in DNA replication. Its job is to repair the missing phosphodiester bond in the backbone left after RNA primers are replaced. So in the Okazaki fragments, we need to replace all of those uh, RNA primers left behind with DNA, but the DNA polymerase one does not seal the nick in the backbone or that last phosphodiester bond when it bumps into the next fragment. The job of doing this is ligase. Next term, operator. The operator is a, a component of the control region of an operon. The control region regulates the transcription of the st structural genes that come afterwards. The operator specifically acts as a sort of traffic light for the RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter, but it cannot move forward with transcription unless the operator says so. So uh, um, in this way, it can act as a traffic light. It can be normally turned off and then induced to go on, or it could be normally off or normally a red, or sorry, it can be normally on, normally a green light, and be repressed into a red light or repressed from uh, transcribing any more genes. Next one, uncoating. Uncoating is a process we see in animal viruses where a virus will enter a host cell seen here and uh, it, it, it gets this membrane around it and it has its uh, nucleic acids still here in the middle of the virion and it needs to release those nucleic acid particles and so this is the process called uncoating. Spikes. Spikes are the structures on the surface of a virus that are used to attach to host cells. Uh, the spikes are specific for um, components on the outside of their host cells. Uh, so this will be involved in determining the host range. Helical virus. Helical viruses like the Ebola virus are made up of capsule mirrors that are in a helical uh, structure. It's a sort of uh, spiral structure like a uh, staircase that house and protect the nucleic acid. Viral envelope. This one's pretty easy. It's the layer of lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates that surrounds the capsid. Not all viruses have envelopes. Some just have a capsomere. tRNA. tRNA is short for transfer RNA they have two very important ends to them. Um, they are a RNA structure that forms kind of a secondary structure where it binds to itself. So it forms uh, uh, a double-stranded RNA in some places. In some places it has these overhangs, which makes it single-stranded. But it's shaped in also a T, so that is uh, helpful for remembering that the, uh, 
the uh, tRNA is responsible for um, bringing the amino acids, which are attached to one end here. So here we have an amino acid attached to an R R tRNA. And on the other end is a codon. So, or sorry, is a anti-codon. Each tRNA has a specific amino acid that will attach to it and a specific anticodon that matches that amino acid. This anticodon is homologous to a specific codon. And that's why codons are the words that are used to write the uh, protein sequence because of this relationship of codon to anticodon to amino acid. tRNA. tRNA stands for transfer RNA. It is a RNA molecule that forms a secondary structure on itself where it has some homologous nucleotides that bind to each other. And as a consequence, it takes up this sort of T shape. It's very important that it is made up of nucleotides because one region called the anticodon can read the mRNA's codons. Here we see that the sequence GCC binds with the anticodon CGG. Uh, each tRNA has a specific anticodon and a specific amino acid. Uh, if a tRNA uh, matches up at the ribosome, for this particular codon, it will transfer its amino acid to the elongating uh, protein um, and then detach. Then the next set of codons will come into the ribosome and this process will repeat itself. So this special relationship of mRNA codon to T tRNA anticodon to amino acid is what enables the ribosome to read the code and make the correct amino acid sequences. RNA splicing. RNA splicing is the process that occurs in eukaryotic organisms. After an mRNA is synthesized, before it can exit the nucleus, it has to be processed. One of these processes is the cutting out of introns and the re-splicing together of exons. The exons are spliced together to make a mature mRNA that is ready to, be, to exit the nucleus and go to the ribosomes. I like to remember this by thinking that the introns stay inside of the nucleus and the exons exit the nucleus. RNA polymerase. As the name implies, this is the enzyme that is responsible for synthesizing the messenger RNA from the DNA. It binds to a promoter region and then using uh, nucleotides assembles the uh, sequence that will be destined for the ribosome. Semi-conservative. Semi-conservative replication is a process that occurs in cells where both old strands from a previous uh, DNA are used as templates and retained in the two new strands, the two new DNA molecules that form from that. So the DNA polymerases are synthesizing one new strand per new uh, double helix that is formed. Fusion. Fusion is the process that envelope viruses can take in order to enter the, uh, the cell in which its envelope actually uh, sort of melts into the uh, membrane of the host and then is released inside of the cell. 
Enveloped viruses can also do endocytosis along with non-enveloped viruses where they actually push their way through the envelope and then must uncoat later. Prion. Prions are infectious agents that are pure proteins. They're often implicated in causing neurodegenerative diseases, and they are both transmissible and inheritable. Prions work on existing proteins in a organism by causing uh, one disease prion can alter the state of a normal functioning prion and turn it into a disease state prion, which is then infectious throughout uh, throughout the organism for all of those proteins that are of a specific disease-causing prion. Lysogenic cycle. The lysogenic cycle is the process that some bacteriophages can take where after injecting their DNA, they can integrate their nucleic acid into the host genome, the host chromosome. And at this point, they become a prophage and they can hang out there while the cell replicates and, and, and lives and, and does its thing. But eventually some sort of environmental factor causes what we call induction. And that's where a copy of the viral nucleic acid is made and the beginning of the lytic cycle starts where uh, biosynthesis and maturation, where new virions are packaged together and then are released via lysis. Codon. Codons are the three letter words that code for uh, either amino acids, a start codon or stop codons. We can take a, any amino acid sequence and we can divide it into three beginning with the start codon, which is always going to be an ATG in the DNA language or an AUG in the mRNA language. ATG can also translate for the amino acid methionine, but nonetheless, we can divide them into three letter categories in this frame. We don't wanna shift the frame because if this said UGA and the next one said, you know, ACU, we would get a completely different reading of this. But the ribosome always knows to start at the start codon. Conjugation. Conjugation is a form of horizontal gene transfer. It is the process of transferring uh, conjugative plasmids through direct cell contact between different bacterial cells. In gram-negative bacteria, conjugation can take place through a sex pilus, which is encoded by a F-positive bacterium. And in gram-positive bacteria, they can produce a sticky surface molecule that allows them to uh, bind to each other and form what is called a mating bridge for DNA transfer. Repressible operon. Repressible operons are um, the opposite of inducible operons. Inducible operons are normally off and they can be turned on through induction. And repressible operons are normally on and they can be repressed or turned off. Picorna viridae. So this is a great table for you to study, make a note card out of and memorize. 
Picorna viridae are single-stranded uh, positive RNA viruses. They can cause the common cold or uh, poliomyelitis. Okay, retrovirus. Retroviruses are a special type of RNA viruses and that they have an enzyme, uh, it's a polymerase called reverse transcriptase. And reverse transcriptase does the opposite of what our cells do. Instead of converting DNA to RNA, it can convert RNA to DNA, which is why it's called reverse transcriptase. And then by doing so, it converts the RNA virus's nucleotide, nucleotides to DNA, and that DNA can be integrated into the host's chromosome. Lagging strand. The lagging strand uh, is a lagging strand because it forms Okazaki fragments. And we can see here in this example, it's the bottom strand. And this is because uh, the polymerase can only write five prime to three prime. And if we look at the two older strands, which are on the outside, we see that they are anti-parallel to each other. So as this uh, DNA strand unzips, one of these newly synthesized strands is going to be replicating in the opposite direction from the, uh, the opening up of the unzipping and unwinding of the DNA strand. And as a consequence, uh, it's going to make these fragments. We have these, this RNA primer that's put down. And as the, your DNA polymerase lands here and starts synthesizing DNA, from five prime to three prime, it's going to run into this other RNA primer and then have to fall off and another DNA polymerase will start over. So as a consequence, this is called the lagging st strand. Nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base is this nitrogen containing compound, which is the unique part of each type of base. Uh, this particular one would be an adenine nitrogenous base. We also have thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And in RNA, we exchange that thymine for uracil. Maturation. Maturation is the step before release where new made, newly made virion parts are assembled into full viruses. Dichotomous key. This is a flowchart of a list of tests that need to be done to categorize an unknown organism. Non-saccharolytics. These are aerobic bacteria. They get their namesake from the fact that they cannot catabolize sugars. They use aerobic respiration to catabolize proteins, and that might be how you see uh, um, some of the tests for looking for non-saccharolytics. We can also view them in a sodium citrate medium to see if they can grow in the presence of sodium citrate as a carbon source. Uh, they can also use ammonium phosphate when proteins are not available. Vogue's Proskauer test. So some enterics or coliforms more specifically can ferment glucose and convert the pyruvate um, into 2,3-butane diol and acetoin. This is just like how some organisms might convert uh, pyruvate into uh, ethanol. 
or uh, lactic acid, these particular organisms can make 2,3-butane diol and the compound called acetoin. And the VP test uh, adds a reagent, the VP reagent, after incubation of the organism and growth is allowed to occur. And if it's there, it will turn a red wine color. Vertical gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer refers to the passage of genes from an organism to an offspring. This is different than horizontal gene transfer, which refers to exchange of genetic information between organisms of the same generation. Amoebozoa. Here we have some amoebozoa here. These are eukaryotic organisms that move through pseudopods or false feet as seen in this top image here. Some of them are parasitic like E. histolytica, which can infect the small intestine and cause amoebic dysentery. And Balamuthia with infection of the brain, which can cause amoebic encephalitis. And some of them are what we call cellular slime molds, although they are not molds at all. They are amoebas. Dimorphic fungus. These are fungi that have yeast-like growth. So we see these single-celled organisms here or mold-like growth where they grow these hyphae. Um, they are often implicated in pathogenic organisms and the form usually depends upon environmental conditions such as temperature, uh, CO2 and oxygen availability, etc. Definitive host. This is the part in a parasite's life cycle where the parasite infects in an adult form and is considered to be sexually mature. We also have intermediate hosts. Um, there can be numerous intermediate hosts and this is where the parasitic form is uh, still in development and not sexually mature. Next one is cyst. This is a, a protective capsule in parasites that is resistant to poor nutrition, oxygen, temperature, etc. Monoecious. This means uh, one house. So within one house, we have both male and female reproductive parts in a single organism. Roundworms. So uh, roundworms we discuss are the most abundant animal group on earth. We talked about several of them, the guinea worm, the loa loa worm, the hookworm, the Wucheria bancrofti. Uh, only some of them are parasitic and these include nematodes, pinworms, whipworms, threadworms, and hookworms. They can range from anywhere starting at one millimeter all the way up to one meter in length. Commensalism. So we have this term called symbiosis, which is where organisms live in, together in close association. They can be in the form of mutualism, where both individuals benefit. Commensalism, where one benefits, but the other is not affected in any sort of negative way. And parasitism, where one individual, the parasite benefits, and the other, being the host, is harmed. Prodromal period. Okay, 
So if you remember this image here, we have uh, several different um, time periods in an infection. The prodromal period is the one in blue. This is a short interval of time after uh, the initial incubation of some diseases where a patient will have early and mild symptoms that are experienced. Exotoxin. Recall that we had both endotoxins and exotoxins. Endotoxins can confuse a lot of people because uh, there can be compounds in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria that can be end endotoxins. They are different from exotoxins, which are um, metabolic products that get released. Uh, these compounds are mostly produced by gram-positive bacteria. They tend to provide specific damage to a host, whereas endotoxins cause a general inflammation. Antigenic variation. Uh, some viruses uh, can do this. Um, this is where they can alter their antigens over time so that the host can not mount an immune response to them. That's because these antigens or these markers on the outside of viruses are what are used by the host's immune system to identify viruses. So we can see that one variation may become quite popular, but as immunity rises to the variation, it declines, and then you can have a second variant that emerges, and this is called antigenic variation, which is different from antigenic shift, where major changes to the types of antigens that are present take place. Parenteral route. Remember, this is one of those we discussed that you might get some different definitions if you look online. The parenteral route, though, is specifically breaches of the skin or mucous membranes. In other words, some sort of a wound or damage to these uh, systems that allow a, a pathogen to enter the body. So, I have made a few what I'd call cheat sheets or things you need to study. There are a lot of terms when we're getting into these specific groups uh, that you need to memorize. And so I tried to consolidate it here to make it uh, a lot more digestible for you. Here are the select eukaryotes. We have the Plasmodium falciparum, Giardia lamblia, uh, Trypanosoma brucei and Trypanosoma cruzi. For protozoans, um, here are uh, again a list of those that we have and uh, what sort of diseases they cause and some unique features associated with them. Okay, now let's get into some other select eukaryotes. We have the clonar. Uh, I can never say this right, Clonorchis sinensis, Entamoeba histolytica, Balamuthia, and slime molds. And so here we have, you know, the flatworms, uh, Chinese liver fluke, for example. Uh, they can be monoecious. They, can, they have incomplete digestive tracts. They have a complex life cycle. They may have uh, oral suckers. For uh, different amoebas, we have the Entamoeba histolytica, the Balamuthia, the slime molds. The slime molds are not molds, in fact, um, but are um, amoebas that can uh, aggregate together, such as Dictostelium. We have different diseases caused by these, like amoebic dysentery and amoebic encephalitis. There are several virulence factors that we've gone over. Um, here are the ones that could occur on the exam. So we would need to be familiar with the virulence factors from these organisms. 
And here is the short list of those. Some of them are, are kind of obvious. We've already talked about mycolic acids from mycobacterium. Other ones are easy because they uh, share the name of the bacterium they come from. For example, we have uh, cholera toxin from Vibrio cholera and tetanus toxin from Clostridium tetani and streptolysin or streptolysin O from streptococcus pneumoniae. That wraps it up for uh, the review. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. The exam is going to be in a similar format to last time. Uh, we'll have a combination of multiple choice, maybe some matching, definitely some short answer in there. The number of questions might vary depending on how many short answer questions I have. Um, but again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about the, the formatting or the uh, content. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So good luck, study hard. Uh, take a look at those tables in particular and make sure you're very familiar with uh, those tables. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.